Professor Yoon Soo Cho from Seoul National University, South Korea. Co-chair is Professor R.C. Pradhan from Hyderabad Central University. Then, Ms. Professor Chirapad Prapand Vidya, is our speaker, he is from Silpkaran University, Bangkok, Thailand. Sitting the left of chairman is Sri Sunil Parekh, representing Holistic Science Research Center. Next to him is Professor Do Thu Ha from Vietnam, Hanoi. Professor Do Thu Ha had a session yesterday, special evening, SRMT session. Uh, she had to miss the flight uh, on account of sickness of her mother, but she continued the decision and came today morning. So we are providing her a slot here. Then to the left side, Professor Tang Min Jun, you know him very well. He's from School of Philosophy, Sudan, Shanghai. So without taking much time, I request Professor Yun Su Cho, Chairman of the session, to begin the proceedings. And I also request her to moderate the sessions. Thank you very much. Professor Yun Su Cho. Yeah, let me, uh, uh, please permit me to be the moderator for this uh, particular session. Um, this session, uh, philosophy of happiness, means and ends is the theme of this session. Uh, now I request uh, Professor Chirapat Prapandavidya from Silpakon University, Bangkok, Thailand, uh, to deliver his lecture. Respected chairperson, distinguished uh, scholar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to participate in this August gathering and very uh, big conference. Uh, the topic I will speak is holistic view of Buddhists in Thailand based on early epigraphic evidence. Uh, the teaching of the Buddha is meant for, for God and human being to get rid of their suffering. The Buddha found a way to get rid of suffering and taught the same to the people of India 26 centuries ago. Holistic view of his teaching is found in the Pali Tipitaka in several places. After the first sermon at the Deer Park, he got 60 disciples who became the Arahantas. He sent 60 monks at the first batch of his disciples to propagate his teaching. The, for the benefit and the happiness of the mass, he used the word Jarathapikkhwe Jarikam Pahujanaya Hitaya Pahujana Sukhaya Lokanukampaya Atthaya Hitaya Sukhaya Deva Manutsanam Desetha Dharmam the early teaching of the Buddha reached the region which is the present-day Thailand as early as 5th century CE. Contact between an India and Southeast Asia, the Nidesha, a commentary on the Sutta Pitaka, on part of the Buddhist Pali canon, ascribed the Sariputta as great disciple of the Buddha, described about the Indian merchant who traveled to different land seeking wealth. Some of the places, such as Suvanabhumi, Takola, Tamali, must have been located in Southeast Asia. Some identify Talu, uh, the Takola with Takuapa and Tamali. Or okay. yeah. Tamralinga with Tamralinga in southern Thailand, the Mahavangsa, the 
chronicle of Sri Lanka state that during the reign of King Ashoka, Theramukala Pabukali Putta, and the third, after the third thousand cent, Thera Sona Uttara, to Suvanapumi, to propagate Buddhism. The earliest inscription found in Thailand seemed to be the two seal of which one is of unknown pro provenance, and the other was found in the uh, Kuan Lupat in Krabi province in southern Thailand. The former was ascribed with Ashokan Prami and along with it, the Ratna symbol, it reads uh, Sapriyasha of Sapiya, while the latter was inscribed with Brahmi script of about 2nd century BCE, probably in the Prakrit language. It read Brahma Dinasa of Brahma Dina. The oldest Buddhist image found in Sikkim, uh, there are two Buddhist images found in very early, found in, in uh, Indonesia, and another one is Vietnam. It belonged to about five to four to five centuries. Buddhists in Thailand during fifth to sixth century CE, the early inscription in Pali belonging to thick, uh, fifth to seventh century CE, and using script derived from the one used the Pallava dynasty of South India were found in great number in the central part of Thailand, especially Nakhon Batum province, where the Dravati kingdom is believed to be situated. The most prevalent inscriptions are those that give the ascent of the Buddha teaching known commonly as Jai Thamma, the word. The meaning is uh, the Tathagata taught about the cause of those things that come into existence due to some cause, and that they will come to an end. That is the philosophy of the great sage, the Buddha. It means that it is due to certain cause that things come into existence. If the court sees it they exist, uh, to exist, the thing caused by it also caused to exist. Nothing is therefore permanent. The verse might have been so important that even during the reign of King Ashoka that he recommended it to be studied seriously by monks, nuns, lay disciples in his rock inscription of Kolkata Bhairat. The Yetama verse of the same period inscribed in golden place using Brahmi script of certain class of 6th centuries CE was also found in, Myan in Myanmar. Another inscription was of this period are those in teaching of the Buddha regarding the dependent origination Patitya Few fragments are found, but the full one can be traced from the Tripitaka. Its meaning is as follows. From, from ignorance come confirmation. From confirmation come consciousness until at the end, power cause the jati or birth to take place. And from birth, that means suffering, lamentation, and despair, despair is the result. If we can get rid of ignorance, then there will be no suffering. Uh, we have also found a very old inscription of the Paticca Samuppada in India about Uh, second century uh, uh, CE. Uh, I uh, now come to a very important uh, inscription found in the southern part of Thailand. It is about the first sermon of the Buddha. The inscription on the Thammachaka Parvatana Sutta, the first sermon of the Buddha, was also given special importance in this period. The fragment of the inscription on the whole Thammachaka Parvatana, or part of the Sutta, were also found in the central part of Thailand. The text sometimes 
inscribed on different parts of the t a m a c h a k a Sometimes on the pillar supporting the t a m a c h a k a Sometimes on the base of the t a m a c h a k a The complete text of the t a m a c h a k a p a v a t a n a Sutta can be traced in the Tripitaka, and it s u m m a r i z e meaning is as follow: Ascetic must not. Uh, must restrain from two extremes. One is life of pleasure, and other is life of mortification. He must follow the middle path, namely the right faith, right resolve, right speech, right action, right living, right effort, right thought, right self concentration. The Buddha said he had removed the both extreme and deliver. Uh, Discover the middle path, which given him the eye to know the truth that leads finally to nibbana. Then the Buddha said about suffering, dukkha. Birth is suffering. Old age is suffering. Sickness is suffering. Death is suffering. To be united with the unloved is suffering. To be separated from the love is suffering. Not to obtain what one desire is suffering. In short, the fourfold clinging to k a n t a t h a t means corporeal form, sensation, perception, conformation, consciousness is suffering. Then the Buddha said about the cause of suffering, which is desire, tanna, which lead to, uh, which lead from birth to birth, desire must be abandoned. Then. He talked about the sacred truth of the extinction of suffering by means of getting rid of desire. Then he talked of the sacred truth of the path leading to the extinction of suffering. It is the eightfold path mentioned above. The Buddha claimed that unless he had the knowledge and understanding of the four noble truth. He had not attained the supreme Buddhahood. At the end of the first sermon, k o n d a n y a one of the five ascetics, saw the truth and exclaimed, "What, whatever is subject to the law of beginning, all that is subject to the law of decay." Comparing with the inscription, uh, inscription found in b u j a n g w a n l e Malaysia. Which had been dated at 5th century BCE, the early Sanskrit inscription in Thailand of the same period, probably be found at ancient monument of Jarang District, Pattani Province, Southern Thailand. They were inscribed on a votive tablet made of clay with the figure of stupa or Buddha image on them. The most prevalent inscription <clears throat> most of them are fragmented and are in Sanskrit words, beginning with Jay Tharma, which is the counterpart of Pali version. The other fragment inscription read Dukkha s a m u d h y a n i r o t a Marga. Suffering, cause of suffering, extinction of suffering, path leading to the extinction of suffering. This is the uh, first sermon. In short, the Sanskrit inscription found in b u j a n g w a l e p i n a n g State, Malaysia, using Brahmi script of the Southern class about 5th century CE, consists of two. Sanskrit word and fragmented passage, and following that, y e t a m a is a, a word in Sanskrit, meaning the action karma accumulated through ignorance is the cause of rebirth. One will not be born if his action was done with knowledge. The meaning of the fragmented passage is follow of the Buddha. Upta. So it means that uh, there is a relation between uh, India and Southeast Asia from this inscription. 
very early. The Sanskrit inscription in the word beginning with Jeta. Uh, so I come to con conclusion. The contact between India and Southeast Asia must have taken place sometime before, before Christ, as Christ, Christian era. But it became active in the early uh, Christian era as evident by artifact and trans uh, inscription. The earliest inscription found in Thailand possibly are uh, the inscription of Sanskrit found at Yerang, Patani province, southern Thailand, which may belong to the same date of inscri uh, inscription found in Bujang Valley in Malaysia. These inscriptions and other Sanskrit inscriptions confirm that early teaching of the Buddha has reached the region which is present-day Thailand as early as 5th century. It may also suggest that Mula Sarawati Vadin of Theravada school exists in Thailand during 5th to 6th century, side by side with Theravada school, which used Pali in, uh, in its scripture. As for the early teaching of the Buddha, which is meant for getting rid of suffering, it stress, uh, stresses that the law of cause and effect must be taken into consideration. To get rid of suffering, one had to get rid of the cause of suffering, that is tanha, thirst or desire, by following the middle part, namely uh, right faith, right resolve, right speed, right action, right living, right effort, right thought, right concentration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chiraput. Now, I would request Sri Sunil Parik from Ahmedabad to come and deliver his thoughts. Pujya Dada Bhagwan, Pujya Kanu Dada Shri, Pujaniya Apta Putras, our patron Vasan Bhai, Conference Chairman Dr. S.R. Bhatt, fellow speakers, distinguished delegates, able team at HSRC, and distinguished scholars. By way of introduction, the following is an extract from the science of liberation and Vyavar Vignan as experienced by Pujya Dada Bhagwan, following his enlightenment while sitting on a bench in Surat Railway Station in 1958. The way to liberation and the way to conduct our life, both aspects have been shared with tens of thousands of Mahatmas who are all reaping benefit of this direct spiritual experiential knowledge today. So let me begin. Man has since time immemorial felt a deep urge to understand the universe and his place in it. His sincere search has led him to many findings, many views and deeper philosophical research. Much has been written, expostulated and shared, but today the world is in a different crisis, a deep crisis of personal faith. People seem to have drifted away, gone away from the classical religion and its preachings to a more basic rational humanism with man at its center, but still feeling alone and lonely. And in a wider perspective, man has also become much more sensual and is leading a life governed by his physical senses, perhaps stemming from a feeling of being lost, a sense of rootlessness, a sense of disconnectedness at an umbilical level from the cosmos around him. In today's time, which is the fifth phase of the descending cycle in the Kal Chakra, man finds it very difficult to find true spiritual path that leads him to happiness, since most avenues are regarded as closed. So he begins to rely for his happiness more and more on material things and the pleasures of his senses. He has also become more egoistic. His pursuits follow his passions today. His measures of success are often also physical and egoism based. Happiness has become just a little more than mere pleasure today. Dada has also said that in today's Kalyug, happiness is just an interval between two places or two episodes of unhappiness. Essentially friends, lack of happiness arises out of one's inability to accept and enjoys one's circumstances and relationships. 
the gap between the reality of one's life and one's expectations from its life is the seed of anapisas one's expectations are based on one's beliefs these beliefs are not permanent and they often change and even the pleasure one derives from them is often temporary short lived and definitely unstable personal beliefs on the other hand are also changing today in this context dada bhagwan science calls such pleasure or happiness as relative happiness to distinguish it from real happiness which is permanent and is not subject or people dependent dada's plain speaking language says that satisfaction happiness and contentment are all based on our own personal beliefs how are beliefs created we live in a world of multiple material goods and people around us and we need to identify them individually and differentiate them on some basis and this leads us to begin to form opinions in the beginning such opinions of classification as useful or wasteful good or bad get hardened over time and friends remember psychologists call it reinforcement behavior which says that the original opinion encourages us to see things in a particular way rather than objectively a psychological predisposition often called prejudice prejudice these hardened opinions then become beliefs and these then become our lighthouses in fact our basic standards that govern us and help us to take decisions and steer our ship in the uncertain waters of today's life's journey family life greatly contributes to our fundamental development of core values of core values and opinions which become our moral compass and provide us a blueprint for personally managing our circumstances and relationship as we go through in life so i want to share with you two examples about belief based happiness first there are two friends and they order a pizza one of them enjoys it thoroughly and the other one does not happiness therefore is not an intrinsic property of the pizza since the two differ in their experience of it happiness of the first person from eating a delicious pizza is based on his likes and his opinion about it whereas the second person's personal likes and experiences and opinions about the taste is totally opposite or take for example the purchase of an expensive mercedes benz car it's a great source of happiness for an upcoming professional a matter of great social and financial standing that it conveys to his peers but when his neighbor acquires a beautiful ferrari and calls everyone to see it the first experience of great joy begins to dim in front of the new development happiness changes because of comparison and leads to jealousy once again the belief changes that the ferrari brings greater status and therefore greater happiness it's all about our experiences our opinions our beliefs the functional requirement of the product itself which is the car is now completely out of the new equation of societal prestige and pleasure both would have done the job of carrying person from place a to place b <clears throat> so the important thing to realize is circumstances will keep changing it is their defining characteristic it is their basic nature is to keep changing and personal expectations to continue to change so you see a world where you have external circumstances are changing and you see your own expectations are changing continuously and the gap between the two is what we call unhappiness and that also becomes uncertain with time and becomes temporary when things don't change exactly according to what one's expectation is about something it causes an happiness which then often leads us to a whole set of negativity for the associated people and the circumstances and this has been our day to day story and regular experience so what are our options in dealing with unhappiness all the complex issue of failures personal losses in the family relationship issues financial problems unsatisfied and overflowing desires diseases death old age sorrow and pain there is a huge amount of current thinking on this issue available on a click of a button on google from well meaning people and gurus today the solution lies in understanding that external circumstances are not in our control 
and must never and must ne must be taken as what they are this causes us unhappiness and creates conflicts this understanding takes us into the next level and that is unhappiness is our reaction within ourselves in response to the way we feel about our external relationships and sour circumstances so many alternative approaches by many others teach us the value of managing our internal reaction and processes much better based on how the antaskaran behaves some prescribe diktats for the masses some provide alternate explanations to quiet the burning mind some take you to find peace in the scriptures and some revisit the word of the lord and some take you to deeper inside in the form of many types of meditations chanting prayers songs group or single therapy sessions and some teaches the value of living in the present instead of dwelling in the past which causes us a pain and the future which is the source of anxiety some which is a very popular today also follow vipassana meditation or buddhism which helps us to actually experience the transient nature of our responses from within it's rising and it's ebbing away helping us to focus on what is going on with what is called full mindfulness <clears throat> after all the motivation of siddharth in seeking the truth and thus becoming buddha was to find a final cure for the pain and suffering of human life and its predicament with the human desire tanna as its root psychotherapy also hails the fact that even the scriptures have espoused for a very long time and that is the negative emotion of anger hatred jealousy and violence lust and attachment do more damage inside us even before they are expressed and perceived and shared with the external cause health balance and moderation rationality all become temporarily helpless against the free reign of these emotions at their peak and cause a lot of pain to both yourself your friends and your families back to dada science dada said that one of the biggest source of internal tension today is the almost universal absence of the oneness of what we think what we speak and what we act man vachan kaya ni ekagrata na loss thavathi there is always a continuous internal tension which is in the pick, the situation in modern man he also said that there are three forms of unhappiness that human being suffer from these are adhi vyadhi and upadhi adhi is the mental uneasiness that is when we sit and keep worrying all day vyadhi is associated with the physical body and pain and discomfort for example a headache or a stomach ache an upadhi is something that comes and from outside and disturbs us that is for example if someone knocks you down in an accident the goal is to free ourselves of these three scorching fires trividh tap by being in constant samadhi it is interesting that in today's world even the west in a holistic way of speaking have now recognized the need for actually measuring developing measures to to for measuring and quantification of happiness and there are two measures that have come in the world for measurement of happiness one is the gross happiness index where bhutan sikkim and these type of countries are really doing well and the other one which is by the united nations when they first produced the first world happiness report in april 2012 and now it has been institutionalized and the last report came out in the month of february and that lays out a good way to measure and quantify about happiness what these reports basically do is that they measure adhi and vyadhi in society and they have developed indices for measuring these and therefore they measure countries and the four top countries in the world are the three nordic countries the so scandinavian countries followed by switzerland america was number 3 in 2012 in spite of being the richest and the biggest economy but is now come down to the place of 19th and the reason in the index that they say is it has come down is because of lack of social support increased corruption and loss of trust in a society the principal reasons for variation of happiness between countries and within countries are essentially three the first is mental health the second is physical health and the third is the issues affecting personal relationships in society and these three constitute the major area 
and if you have to look at one single reason which is the principal source of unhappiness in the world today that is adhi which is mental worry and mental problems and this is not directly linked to lack of money and there is no correlation with poverty and lack of health so which means even when you have prosperity you have mental health issues <clears throat> this science of liberation of dada gives an example of the constant feeling of insecurity insecurity that one experiences when one is living in someone else's house compared to the total peace that you enjoy when you are living in your own house the body assembly of sunil that is mind speech and body is an object that is to be seen as totally separate from my own real self this real self is only a seer and knower of all that sunil is experiencing this act of knowing and seeing is totally neutral and remains steady while the experiences of sunil may be that of happiness or sadness the real self state of happiness is not dependent on the condition of sunil's being his relationships or his circumstances and therefore progressively takes us on to a stage of experiencing a permanent state of inner joy which is called anand further from the perspective of dada science the understanding is that our current current life and circumstances are the direct result of whatever has been shaped by us in our earlier lives it also explains how exactly is the blueprint of our future life is being created in our present life by us today it also explains in detail how this blueprint then gets transmitted from one life to another life and then it explains how exactly does this blueprint that we have created for ourselves pans out in the next birth this is the law of karma so the point to understand for happiness is that the cause of all my life's relationship issues and unhappy circumstances is that it is only i who is wholly and solely responsible for whatever is happening to me in my life i will repeat it is only i who is wholly and solely responsible for whatever that is happening to me in my life this is a very humbling and an ennobling realization this life therefore is a direct consequence of my intents of bhav karma of my previous birth very often created out of ignorance in their consequences for the next life once the process is understood the mind then begins to accept things as they are the desire to change our relationships and circumstances that burning desire gets milder and milder and one is able to adjust much more easily one of the consequences of understanding this transactional nature of this universe is that all the individuals in our relationships now become innocent they are just messengers delivering my own dues of happiness and unhappiness as the time goes on so this is the birth of what we call nirdosh drishti it is when everyone we regard as innocent in our eyes it is a very big darshan that opens out and leads us to happiness in everyday life in ways that only we can experience it if you get on to this path and this is the experience of all our mahatmas who live in samadhi with this there are other similar very powerful aphorisms emanating as a consequence of understanding that capture the essence of this teaching and make it very easy and useful to apply in one's daily life these are very practical and effective and actually lead us to reduction and elimination of conflicts in our life leading us to tranquility in day to day living so many mahatmas are enjoying this normally we regard happiness as our goal but in case of our mahatmas we are living with happiness we are not living for happiness i repeat there is a very big distinction we are living with happiness and we are not living for happiness so the four key aphorisms for happiness and these are really keys that professor lee also shared one of them and there were other speakers also that actually give you a methodology of simply solving the puzzle in life and this leads to a better day to day living and then also opens the gate and makes us purer and gets us ready for final liberation and the four of these aphorisms are number 1 in gujarati it says 
भोगवे तेनी भूल ट्रांसलेटेड इट मीन्स वन हु सफर्स इज एट फॉल्ट दिस एज वी हैव सीन इज अ डायरेक्ट कॉन्सिक्वेंस ऑफ द बेसिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन दिस वर्ल्ड अराउंड अस ईच वन ऑफ अस इज होल्ली एंड सोल्ली रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर वॉट एवर इज हैपनिंग टू ईच वन ऑफ अस सेकेंड एफोरिज्म अथड़ा मन टाड़ो ट्रांसलेटेड मीन्स एवॉइड क्लैशेज फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ यू हैव इन्वाइटेड सम वन टू अ फैमिली फंक्शन एंड देन वी गेट लेफ्ट आउट फ्रॉम द इन्विटेशन लिस्ट वेन दैट फैमिली हैज अ फंक्शन ही फगेट्स टू कॉल अस नो रेसिप्रोकल एक्सपेक्टेशन आर टू बी एक्सरसाइज इफ वन इज हर्ट इट मीन्स दैट वन हैज सीन द अदर एज एन इंडिपेंडेंट डूअर ऑफ वॉट इज डूइंग बट इफ यू सी हिम एज अ मैसेंजर ऑफ डिलीवरिंग पेन टू यू देन ही रिमेन्स इनोसेंट एंड यू कलेक्ट योर पेन एंड बी ऑन योर वे द इम्पॉर्टेंट मैसेज इज डू नॉट बिल्ड न्यू नेगेटिविटी एंड कर्मर्स वाई डीलिंग विद सच टिपिकल सिचुएशन अराइजिंग आउट ऑफ योर पास्ट इन योर प्रेजेंट लाइफ दिस इज द की टू सक्सेस एंड टू बेटर लिविंग एवॉइड द सीड्स ऑफ कॉन्फ्लिक्ट ऑल टूगेदर द थर्ड एफोरिज्म इज बन यू ते न्याय विच मीन्स वॉट एवर एज हैपन इज नैचुरल जस्टिस इट इज वाइज देर फॉर नॉट टू अप्लाई ह्यूमन लॉज लॉज ऑफ द कोर्ट्स और लॉज बेस्ड ऑन म्यूचुअल रेसिप्रोसिटी इन आर रिलेशनशिप्स इट्स अ ग्रैंड एक्सेप्टेंस ऑफ थिंग्स एज दे आर बिकॉज दैट इज रिगार्डेड एज द फंडामेंटल ट्रूथ थिंग्स हैपन ओनली बिकॉज ऑफ अर्लीयर कॉजेज एंड नेचर मेक्स नो मिस्टेक इट इज वन हंड्रेड परसेंट परफेक्ट द फोर्थ एफोरिज्म दैट टेक्स अस टू हैप्पीनेस एंड टू लिबरेशन is a positive drashti which means in every circumstances of our life there is always a choice as to how you see it positively or negatively for example if your little finger gets cut do you lament the fact that your kinder your finger has been cut or are you happy that you still have 19 more fingers and that you are functionally absolutely okay each even at the level of the intellect such positive views create an aura of happiness and do not allow you to breed and suffer during this whole science it is important to understand that whatever relative happiness is in a subtler way there are other insights and inspirational wisdom under the subjects of principles of freedom through apology the science of karma the science of assign essential universal truths of all religions of the world which is available in the book stall behind the science of money where does money go where does money rest and what is the science behind money and more about doubt and mistrust finally in the end these life after life of unending birth and death constant struggles and the continuous rise and ebbs of one's ever changing circumstances makes us ache deep within it's suffocating and there is a thirst a renewed desire to step out of this suffocating perennial philosophically meaningless cycles of life and death and this indeed is the beginning of the search for the final personal salvation of man i bow in obeisance to dada bhagwan for his krupa to help me to realize that i am not a human being experiencing spiritual life today but in fact i am a spiritual being experiencing a human life Om Shanti 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 Thank you very much Professor Parikh All our speakers are very senior most and learned people I need not to say anything to them but let me just clarify one thing that to organize this conference the organizers have given their more than one years effort and hard work So what we can do at least we can give few minutes of our and we can curtail our speech to few minutes i am nobody to say anything i am not an authority but as i am only an moderator and mc of this session i had been instructed by the organizers so hope nobody will mind and everybody will cooperate with the organizers thank you very much now i invite another speaker professor tang mung jong from china we have heard him yesterday please I'll request everybody to clap for him, and let us listen this young scholar from China. Uh, thank you very much for the conference to give me one more chance to make my make a presentation, present what uh, about my recent studies in Buddhist logic. 
uh, the title of my presentation this time is the concept of sadhana in Chinese Buddhist logic. And the sadhana, and uh, I'd like to trace the origin of the Chinese interpretation of the sadhana in, uh, from Indian, uh, into Indian sources. Uh, I, I will be briefly, brief, as brief as I can. And uh, as I have mentioned yesterday, the Chinese tradition is mainly there are only two translated texts from Sanskrit in the Chinese literature. The one is Nyaya Dignagas Nyaya Mukha. The other is Shankara Swami's Nyaya Pravesha. And uh, the Brahmana Samchaya was unfortunately untranslated by Xuanzang. And uh, I will skip, skip those details. Yes. And uh, I have uh, do an, uh, carried out an exhaustive study of these two basic texts, the Nyaya Mukha and Nyaya Pravesha. And uh, I, as I found, uh, there are only two meanings of the concept of sadhana in these two basic texts. They are sadhana one as this remembered argument, Paksha uh, Hetu Drishtanda. And the second concept, the second meaning of sadhana is means sadhana dharma, the Hetu the head of property. Uh, and, but it's very strange that in the Chinese interpret commentaries, comment, all the commentarial literature in China, in Chinese, written in Chinese, they uh, consistently, uh, consistently emphasize that sadhana only have the third meaning. The third meaning means that uh, sadhana means the trirubia, the three conditions, or means the reason statement together with the two example statement. Means the Hetu and the Sadharma Drishtanda and the Vaidharmiya Drishtanda. Sadharmiya Drishtanda and the Vaidharmiya Drishtanda. The three statements all means the three conditions, but not sadhana as a three member argument, nor sadhana as reason property. So I uh, the first part of my, of my paper is to trace this sadhana three into Indian literature. And as I, as I found, uh, this, uh, in Dignaga's early thoughts, Dignaga uses it, like in his Nyaya Mukha, he uses sadhana one and sadhana two, but there is no sadhana three. But in his Brahmana Samjaya, he uses sadhana three. And difference of sadhana three from sadhana one is that he excluded the pa Paksha from sadhana. And this is very important in development um, from Dig Naga's early thought to his later thought. And uh, so uh, from this evidence, we can know that um, uh, as, we, as previously, we, as, uh, we assumed that uh, the doctrinal lineage of, uh, from Dig Naga to the Chinese tradition is just like this. Dignaga wrote two treatises, the Nyaya Mukha and Brahmana Samjaya. The Chinese tradition inherited the, the, the Nyaya Mukha, but not the Brahmana Samjaya. And uh, it's Dharma Girdi, he commented on the Brahmana Samjaya and uh, interpreted it. But uh, now, from textual evidence as I have collected, we can have a new lineage. The new lineage is that the Brahmana Samjaya is also in the framework of the Chinese tradition, although this treatise is, 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 was not translated by Xuanzang and his translation team. And uh, yes, this is the first part of my, uh, this is the first conclusion of my paper. Now I will move to the second. Mm, as claimed by Telemans in his 1991 article, the point at stake from sadhana 1 to sadhana 3 is not a terminological one, but about how logical works in Buddhist logic. And the theoretical implication behind will be brought into light if we look the matter from a different angle and take into account the new development resulting from the new definition of sadhana in reinterpreting the fallacy, the fault called the incompleteness, new natta in an argument. As we seen from Dignaga's Nyaya Mukha, a sadhana consists of three statements, Paksha, Hetu, and Drishtanda. 
And uh, it said in the Nyayamukha that thus it should be understood that lack of any of these three statements is called a fault of sadhana. It's called nyunata. But in the Brahmana Samujaya, it's, called, it's said that uh, incompleteness, it should be called incompleteness. When, when, you, when any one of the three conditions, conditions is unstated. So in the Dignaga's early thought, incompleteness means, means incompleteness in, in the statement. But in Dignaga's later thought, incompleteness means incompleteness in logical roles. Uh, what is altered here is not merely the fa fallacy called incompleteness, as handed down from the early phase of Indian logic, but also the conception of what factors contribute to the completeness of an argument, and in the absence of some, an argument has to be counted as being incomplete or being unsound. We are now inclined to call them the property factor. Indeed, a plenty of elements can be regarded as being capable of contributing to the completeness of an argument. At first, there should be certain linguistic expression with certain ideas the proponent would like to communicate with the opponent. And this expression should be capable of explicate those ideas in obeying certain semantic conventions. Even the intelligence of the, the opponent would who should be intelligent enough to pick out a meaning as same as the proponent intends through his speech, as well as a just circumstance where argument from each side can be evaluated only according to principles for thinking rationally, should also be presupposed as necessary prerequisites for an argument to be practical, practically possible. Therefore, by the, by the term property factors, we do not mean all the necessary conditions for an argument to be complete, which are nearly infinite, but only the factors which were actually selected by certain theoreticians in the history as the focus on which their theorization of argument concentrated. So the property factor is just a metallurgical concept, but not a first order one. This is only a concept used to represent or recapture the main concern of a logician in his theory of argument. In fact, we are bound to select only a limited number of elements for reflecting on arguments in a theoretical manner. And this does not prevent us from recognizing the fact that there are definitely are other elements yet theorized in our present framework or even yet unobserved. The mere illustration of property factors, necessary conditions, contributes just as little as a good institution, a good common sense of what a sound argument looks like to a theory of argument, let alone its being a theory of logic. The key feature of a theory is that the property of factors that are identified in it is at the same time considered as the criteria for discriminating in a general way a sound argument from an, an unsound one. Therefore, a theory of argument could possibly step on different approaches in identifying different property factors and result in different systems of criteria for sound argument, as well as different systems of logic. Now I come to the text. It's said in our text that uh, according to Vasubandhu and the scholars between Vasubandhu and Din Naga, incompleteness means the incompleteness in the, in the three statements. In, in the three statements, as told in our text, the property factors were identified by logicians before the Naga with the linguistic expression comprised of the thesis, the reason, and the, re the, the example. When one of these factors is lacking, the whole argument has the fault of incompleteness. Yet an unclarified point here is that the linguistic expression itself could contribute to the incompleteness or soundness of an argument in two ways. On one hand, the linguistic expression could be probative in representing certain form of valid reasoning. On the other hand, it could be probative in that the reason statement together with the example statement in it is or is accepted to be true. As we know today, an argument could be regarded as sound if and only if all its premises are true and the form is valid. 
Therefore, if the identification of property factors with linguist expression itself does not merely represent a good intuition of what a sound argument looks like, it could possibly provide the Buddhist logicians with two different options in theorizing the completeness of an argument. We name the form first option uh, the formalistic approach in that the logic logical form itself is identified as property of fact. As to the second option, to identify the truths of premises or, the, of, or of the reason statement with the example statements as property of fact, to theorize this point and to let the truths of both statements be criteria for discriminating sound argument from unsound ones, we gave the name epistemic approach or dialectic approach, depending on which conception of truth was taken by the ancient logicians. I skip this page. And uh, it's, it, it's, let's, let's continue with text. It's said in the text that uh, according to Bodhisattva Din Naga, uh, incompleteness means incompleteness in the three conditions, in the incompleteness in the Chayrubya. And uh, now the Buddhist, uh, uh, as a detailed uh, account of the Chayrubya formula, as interpreted in the Chinese tradition is not in place here, we can make no decision between the epistemic approach and the dialectic approach as which one was actually stepped on by logicians following Dignaga. However, the evidence from our text does surface to support what the view that at least the formalistic approach was not the one stepped on. For this aim, we just need to point out that the incompleteness or unsound arguments which are to be rolled out by the three characteristics are also of the same logical form with that of sound argument in Buddhist logic. And then in my paper, I, I give three examples. The first example is that the first condition, Paksha Dharmadva, is not satisfied. Uh, the second, second case is that the second condition, the Sapaksha Sadvam, Sapakshya Sattvam, this condition is not satisfied. And uh, the third condition, the third case, I gave the third case is that the third condition, the Vipakshya Asattvam is not satisfied. And uh, through uh, the analysis of these two conditions, these two arguments, these three arguments, we know that in all the three cases above, I felt a valid form of reasoning has no function for discriminating sound argument from unsound ones. They are just considered as sound on account of the, five minutes, of the lacking of this or that characteristic. The property factors in this theory are not the logical form, but are the three characteristics. Or, to speak simply, the truth of the premises of an argument. Therefore, I move to my conclusion. Uh, in the development from Masubandhu to Dignaga and his Indian and Chinese followers, and in the new interpretation of the sadhana as the triple characterization of valid reason, instead of the linguistic expression of a three-membered argument, what comes to the fore is a more and a more clarified conception of what is essentially decisive in an argument. In identifying the decisive factor with the chayrubya or the truth of premises, the truth of hetu, Vajana and Drishtanda Vajana. Ding Naga and his followers lead the Buddhist theory of argument to an approach sharply different from that of formal logic of their European colleagues. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>